Welcome to the Lean AI Podcast, where we're flipping the AI conversation on its head by focusing on holistic strategies and tactics that drive AI adoption, rather than focusing solely on overcoming the technical challenges of AI. In every season one episode of the Lean AI Podcast, we talk with corporate AI leaders just like you, who've uncovered secrets of driving successful AI adoption with far less wasted time and investment. Our guests challenge established views and offer disruptive perspectives, providing new actionable insights. Welcome to the Lean AI Podcast. Today, we're excited to welcome Vivek Mahapatra, a distinguished leader in AI and go-to-market strategies at Salesforce. Vivek has a remarkable track record in transforming business operations through AI, having led global initiatives and built high-performing teams. With his unique perspective on product performance and people, Vivek has driven the successful adoption of AI-powered solutions, both internally and for external customers. His expertise spans from leading AI strategy in the ASEAN region to shaping competitive intelligence globally. Vivek's leadership is a testament to the transformative power of AI in driving market leadership and innovation. Welcome, Vivek. We're thrilled to have you on the show. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. I'm excited to be here as well. So, Vivek, you have a lot of experience in bringing new products to market, including in the machine learning and AI space. For our listeners, can you give us a flavor of the types of use cases you've worked on? Absolutely. Thanks, Ben. So early in my career, I started working on machine learning before it was even called machine learning or if it was even cool. And what was really interesting about the use case then, which is very similar to the use case now, like 20 plus years later, is that the most important thing to start with is not how cool the technology is, but how important the business outcome is. And so from a use case perspective, way back when it was machine learning, it was as simple as routing calls to the right person who has the skill set to help you resolve your issue. Because if you work in a call center or a service environment, you'll notice that a lot of times, I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning thinking, you know, I'd love to call a call center today or spend any amount of time in a customer service environment. So you think about how much, not just average handle time, but one call resolution. There's a lot of things that happen in the service space. And many times customer loyalty is based entirely on that one interaction. No matter how many times you've served the customer, If they have a better interaction with you in a customer service environment when they're most upset or at most distress, then they immediately will make kind of a snap judgment, be like, you know what, when I really needed it, it didn't work. So the reason I say that is what the machine learning algorithm was, is figuring out the ways in which you could analyze the conversation tone and behavior, et cetera, to then say, you know what, I think Ben is the right person to handle this call. And most likely Ben will connect best with Vivek to help get to a one call resolution not even about reducing average handle time, but getting to that one call resolution uh, that the customers we were working for back then were you know, large financial institutions and they had some pretty critical relationships with customers. So switching costs were, were not negligible, but any time they lost a customer, it was extremely expensive to win them back. So I think about the use cases very much from a business outcome perspective. What is the actual ROI that you're going to get out of it? I think a lot of times people look at a lot of these great tools and products and say, oh my goodness, I could fly a jet with this. And it's like, well, are you going to? And how much time, energy, and effort is that going to take? But what is it that you're really going to do with somebody that's going to help you save money or make money? Such an important point. And it's an emerging theme, uh, both in the in the business that you know Lean Startup Co. does with customers, but also on the podcast, a very emergent theme is the fact that it's not just about, quote unquote, the technology. And so... Could you tell us a little bit more about the business outcomes that you've helped companies to generate, either for internal workflows or external customers? So within Salesforce, the ecosystem, right, we've got customers all over the world, every industry, every segment that you can think of. And so many times what we'll do is, is like a three-step process. If you think about how quickly somebody can adopt technology in the way they do work today, so the least amount of disruption, because change management is so, so important. And if a lot of times companies will ignore change management. They get excited about technology. And they're like, oh, you know, here's, here's a great way to use this technology. But they're not thinking about how easy is it for people to adopt the technology and also, again, back to the outcomes. And then ultimately, what is the actual strategy to make it like a long-term addition to how people work? And so ways in which I look at the business outcomes where I'm working with different customers in different segments, most recently, there was a couple of folks, uh, a couple of companies in the airlines industry, for example, And they're trying to figure out ways to service their highest value customers in the best, most effective possible way. And so in order to do that, they actually need to offload some of the simpler requests using AI. 
So if they have knowledge articles, for example, right? In, in Salesforce, we, we have something called Service Cloud. It's a solution that helps customers customer service. A lot of our customers use knowledge articles and those knowledge articles help customer service reps respond most effectively. So whether you're somebody who's been at the company for one year or 10 years, you look at the knowledge article, it helps you respond to the customer. So you can think about like the bell curve of types of questions people get. And a lot of times, you know, there's, there's a lot of them that almost 80% of them are probably the same types of questions or iterations of the same question. But it's the long tail of questions that are the more complex questions and the ones that drive the most dollar value for the customer. And so working with customers to say, okay, so how do we help you resolve, let's say, the most common cases that you get in the call center faster? How do we help you save money there and then invest time and energy in sort of like the more complex use cases for the higher value customers so they become even bigger spenders or more loyal to your brand? So that's from like an airline's use case. But you could easily look at that financial services. In fact, we're just talking to a team here for a very large bank. And they were looking at something as simple as, I have a client come in, I'm a consumer banker. I want to make sure I have the most up-to-date information about that person when they arrive. So that if Ben walks in and Ben needs a loan, I know Ben needs a loan. Or let's say Ben walks in and Ben needs to get his 529 for his kids. I know that and I'm not offering him the wrong product. Because think about it, right? You walk in and you have this experience and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to waste all this time answering these questions, catching up a new banker every time I talk to them. But when you have things like data and AI in a single platform, it's very easy then to say, oh, Ben's here. What does Ben want? Here's all the interactions Ben has had. And therefore, let me provide him this next best offer or this next solution or product within my organization. So that's just an example from like airlines or financial services of use cases that drive ROI and Sikius. Well, it sounds like you have a fun job because those are some pretty eclectic use cases. And uh, I know you've got a lot of other things you're working on as well. I really want to dive into the three-step process because that's the kind of concrete stuff that we want to share with everyone. And before we dive into kind of those lean practices around AI development, I guess, given your extensive experience across all those different use cases that we just talked about, what are the common mistakes you're seeing that lead companies to waste time and money to build AI products that customers don't want or adopt? Oh my goodness. Oh, where do I start? There was actually a presentation I did recently, and I was thinking about this. I started with the comment, especially specifically when large language models made their way on the scene, there was this like wide-eyed wonder, and everyone was kind of going crazy, utilizing it every possible facet of their lives. And like the first mistake people made there is they didn't think about how the technology works. So they didn't understand that if you misused it, or let's say, well, first of all, that you couldn't trust it immediately, so hallucinations. The second is, if you put in data into the public domain in something like uh, perplexity or ChatGPT, whatever those different tools are out there, especially in the beginning, that data would be part of the large language model moving forward. Now, there's a lot of back and forth about the fact that is there enough weights for people to find that data again, I understand, but ultimately putting customer data into a large language model that's publicly accessible is incorrect. And so like hallucinations, the lack of customer data, proprietary uh, security, et cetera, I would say that another couple of really interesting things that we saw customers doing is, and I joke in customer presentations, like we just blew a whole bunch of money on these use cases and we didn't think about the guardrails. We didn't think about essentially the outcomes. We didn't have a really defined strategy. And so it's like this wide-eyed wonder to cautious curiosity. And now everyone is doing what I'm calling like iterative experimentation, where it's like, okay, we learned from our mistakes. We're still excited. We still want to be delving into the technology. But let's make sure it's the right hammer for the right nail. So Vivek, thank you for those. Could you now tell us about that three-step process you mentioned earlier and tell us if and how it might address some of those mistakes that you've seen big companies make? I'm going to complicate this slightly and I'm going to make it a three, three-step processes. Or actually, it's three ways to think about it and I'll like, explain it as I get into it. So first of all, every time I talk to customers, there's a common theme that emerges is that there's a lack of alignment internally. So once you have the alignment within the company, then you figure out, okay, I have alignment, you know, from top down, I know that we're going to use AI in the flow of work. What are the outcomes I'm driving towards, right? What's the business value of these outcomes? And then let's define the strategy versus, and especially in the strategy, by the way, it's around like, what kind of data do I need, which is a critical part of the strategy, and then figuring out the actual steps. So alignment outcome strategy is sort of the three most common ways in which customers can move forward effectively in deciding how to use AI in the flow of work. The second thing 
in the three by three I'm about to talk about is figuring out where in sort of this maturity curve you, you stand. And this maturity curve is something that uh, the AI COO uh, at Salesforce came up with when we've workshopped with a whole bunch of folks internally. And the idea is that, can we think of this new process as you, so you sort of brought people along and you've changed the way they think. And now you're saying, hey, by the way, blue sky, what do you think about this? And suddenly everyone's much more open to taking, it's kind of crawl, walk, run, but it's very much like out of the box, then do some little customization configuration. And then boom, let's think about entirely new uh, ways to, to make it work. And then the last part of my three by three is the best way to make that happen that we've worked with customers, right? First is identifying what is strategy for success, alignment, outcome, and then the data AI strategy. The second one is where do they sit in this, in this maturity model, which is, are they ready for out of the box? Are they ready for more customization and configuration or blue sky thinking? And so the last one is, all right, let's get together and let's do some word shopping. Let's get some use cases on the wall. Let's like, you know, write it up, think about, and don't hold back. Like everyone just get some use cases, get some, uh, you know, post-its, put it up on the wall, everyone's talking and it's throw spaghetti in the wall kind of situation. As that happens, figure out of all those use cases, what's the business value? There's some really cool use cases up there, but they might not be good business value. It might be kind of a cool thing to do, has no impact on the customer, no ROI. So maybe scratch that for now. And then one critical part that people miss in this step is actually seeing the product at work. So we work a lot with customers and we'll literally go on site and say, hey, let's do some workshops. Let's show you how Prompt Builder or Copilot or Custom Actions works within your flow of work. So within Sales Cloud or Service Cloud, we'll show it to them. And then suddenly that wall of use cases blows up with 10 more ideas. Because they're like, wait a second, now that I've seen it, I've touched it, I've played with it, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And then that cycle starts again, which is the use case, business value, workshop. Use case, business value, sorry, hands-on. And that's sort of the workshopping ideas. That's sort of the three by three to answer your question, making it slightly more complicated, but yeah. No, I love it. Tell me how iterative experimentation fits into what you just talked about. Is that something that would happen post-workshop where, hey, we've got some ideas, now we need to go experiment? In both steps, so the use case, business value, and the actual hands-on, a lot of that happens as soon as the customer gets hands-on. They're like, oh, okay, hold on a second. Can we try this out? Can we sign a, a small POC or you know, get started with uh, 10 people or 100 people or something like a slightly smaller group of folks, whether it's and then the term pilot, POC, trials, like everyone's talking about them. But ultimately, having some skin in the game is really important. And so that iterative experimentation happens then. Because when there is no skin in the game, there is no drive towards an outcome. And so you can continue to work on iterative experimentation forever. My brother's a doctor, MD, PhD, and he spends a lot of his time doing experiments. And there's some experiments that he does where he's like, you know, I could do this experiment for 20 years. It wouldn't matter because there's no outcome I'm driving towards versus the research he's doing right now is very much targeted at brain tumors for children. So he knows that like there's milestones that he's working towards. And so it's having those milestones that are critical to the business that help with the iterative experimentation, which is why I think as soon as that workshopping starts and the customer gets hands on, it's super important to take three use cases off the wall and say, all right. Where in the model maturity, like maturity model are you? And then let's figure out alignment outcomes, what's the strategy and execute on it. How would you, with a use case that you've taken off the wall and you say, hey, we're going to move towards a proof of concept or a pilot. What are the milestones that you think about? So you, you've workshopped, you've said, hey, this is something that aligns with strategy. And now we're going to go and actually work this use case to find out if it's the right one to invest in or not. How does that work? For different customers, it's a little different. And, and I say this, it's like caveat because uh, whether we like it or not, the way in which we work, depending on the industry that we're in or the segment that we're in is either fast or slow. Like I'll just keep it very simple, fast or slow. And unfortunately, there are some industries where we're very slow. And in those industries, I would say that we need to have a couple of different parallel efforts happening at once. We're like different approvals because like info second stuff gets involved. And so it's super important to take three use cases, normally I like to go with threes, as you've noticed by now, three use cases off the wall, think about defining the scope quickly, and also understand that you have the support from the alignment. And if possible, work towards, I don't like to say soft metrics, but work towards something where you've got enough momentum behind it to move from just sort of like that POC to sort of an expansion. And I, I like internally at Salesforce, 
we're seeing a lot of customers, right? They'll start with a small investment. And then within three, four months, it's like a 10x investment because they're seeing the ROI so quickly. Something as simple as, like I said earlier, the knowledge got service supplies are like, oh my goodness, I've seen the, the impact so quickly. And then they're coming up with other really cool use cases. I hope I answered the question. I'm not sure if I did though. It's great. I do a lot of geeking out on this kind of stuff. So the way I've come to think about it is leading indicators of adoption. And so you call those, I like the way you phrase it, it's softer because you can't adopt something that, that isn't there yet and the full experience isn't there. But what are the string of leading indicators that indicate eventual adoption? And so there's a tale of those, which might start with showing a mock-up to someone and then saying, yeah, this looks good. I think I'll use that. Good place to start, bad place to end because to your point, there's no skin in the game. <laughs> but then you can move on and say, okay, at least we got some kind of verbal confirmation and we can start looking at other stronger leading indicators. I'd like to add a little tidbit to this. I think when you and I are first catching up on this topic, something that I noticed, and I, I've been talking a lot to different students, I really enjoy like working with venturing startups and early stage companies, et cetera. And one of the things that we did with my alma mater, Vassar, is I, I went back on campus, actually it also did it with NCAT, but with Vassar more recently with college students. And um, we did this entrepreneurship pitch. And I remember I had spent the week in New York with customers. And then I went upstate to, to campus to do this pitch. And the week in New York with customers, you know, CEOs and CIOs, they're all just sort of like anxious. They're like, what do we do? How do we show value? Like my job's on the line. You know, what's the next steps? What do you think? Sort of all looking for answers. And there was a lot of uncertainty and fear, anxiety, really. And then I go to campus and I show up and there's this entrepreneurship pitch. And all these students, I would say of the eight finalists, 50% of them didn't even use technology, by the way. They were figuring out some stuff, that, like different business ideas. But the ones that actually were looking at technology, they mentioned AI for maybe 30 seconds in their pitch. It was just assumed, expected, part of their day-to-day. -day. And the reason I mentioned this is I think that as we look at the approaches or, or how people are feeling about AI and the flow of work, there is a spectrum of folks that have been in the industry or have been working, let's say, for 10, 20, 30 years and then there's folks a little bit earlier in their industry, and there's this sense of anxiety and disruption. I'm going to lose my job. I don't have skills, et cetera. And then you look at this incoming workforce. They're like, yeah, okay, AI is everywhere. So what? It's part of my job. I'm just going to use it. You know, they're using it to answer questions and write papers. So they're coming into the workforce ready to go. The reason I mention this, Ben, is that I feel like, and I said the soft metrics is, I feel like many of the larger industries or larger companies or companies with lots of regulated rules, et cetera, are slowing down innovation without realizing that the disruption is going to catch up with them much faster because they're trying to hold on to certain things that the incoming workforce, that's also going to be the incoming customers and the incoming spenders, are their expectations are already that AI should be everywhere. And yes, there is what you know, like I said earlier, different types of AI and, and machine learning, predictive, et cetera. But if we're not making the best use of technology and data and insights about our consumers, we're going to lose them very quickly. Customer expectations all time high, loyalty all time low, switching costs is almost negligible. And so folks are not going to spend their money at these large monolithic enterprises. They're going to start to look at who understands me quickly, who's going to give me the best possible service, and who's the easiest to work with, which is sort of an analogy to best technology, I guess. It's a really important point, and it is a huge shift in the way things work, and we need to be cognizant of that. So let me ask you this. I really want to get a level deeper, if possible, into, I love your three by three, right? And so I'm a Excel guy, right? So I've got like an Excel sheet in my head, and I'm filling in boxes. After a company has alignment, right, and they've got a strategy, they know what business outcomes they're going after, and they've got a strategy that's kind of tying all that together. And they've done kind of their maturity curve and they say, okay, we're ready to move from just out of the box to more of the, I think you put it, customization through flows and blue sky thinking. And then there's a workshop. And typically then, as you put it, that's when you start with 10 use cases, but then it blossoms into 100 and then 1,000. So you've got this parking lot of AI use cases. What are the best practices that you have in terms of maybe applying the lean startup principles of pivot, persevere, kill? Sometimes we call it pivot, persevere, park now. Are all 100 of those that are kind of strategically aligned going to get built? And if not, how do you think about a funnel of picking out the strongest use cases through iterative experimentation? 
one of the things that happens is the leadership that's involved at the alignment level will determine if you need to pivot or persevere or park. So if you're at the CEO level and the CEO is looking for use cases for efficiency in customer service or looking for productivity in sales or increased productivity, let's say in sales offers, that will change the nature of like the discussions we're having with customer. So many times we're sitting down, we're going kind of looking at marketing use cases, it's obviously sales and service industries, et cetera. And based on sort of who's involved and who has not just the power or influence, but also the wallet is willing to spend the money on those use cases or the time, forget the money for a second, just the time that helps to determine the pivot, persevere and parking lot. And to keep to your P's, I would say sort of power is, is the word that ultimately, unfortunately, in business context, and again, it could be power of uh, the role, power of the technological expertise. So they might say, hey, we can't do these use cases. So as the C-suite, CIO, I kind of put my foot down and therefore we have to pivot now. Or it could be power of the wallet where it's like, I don't have CFO could say, nope, don't have the money for it. So if you want to do it, it better be a use case that's making money or cutting costs. I would say that the power determines the pivot, persevere, and parking of uh, different use cases. And how does the iterative experimentation play into the decision to pivot, persevere, or park, or does it? It does. No, it does. I'll tell you why it does. Because, and it's funny, like, just literally just had a conversation yesterday with two very big customers. And oddly enough, like, financial services again. And what happened was, because we showed up with a decent set of, not even metrics, like, it wasn't even success metrics. Like, we showed up understanding the business really well. We were able to help show them the iterative experimentation was getting them certain steps along the way. And so they immediately were like, we are not going to pivot. We're going to persevere or we're going to make this happen. And it was funny because one of the meetings I had was just showcasing some of the things that are coming at Dreamforce. So pre-Dreamforce, we'll meet different customers and share the latest and greatest. Actually, one of those are retailers as well. So it wasn't just financial services. And they were just so excited about the direction that we were taking our technology that instead of pivoting or parking, they're like, all right, you know what? We're going to persevere. And funnily enough, Ben, they were not even in the in sort of the maturity model. They were basically in step one or step two. Like they were just trying out of the box stuff. But they saw so much ROI from the out of the box that they said, you know what? We're going to, we're going to push forward. I think it pays a huge part when you have the right people in the room because, and back to your P's, people as well, I guess, is another one where there is so much misinformation and wrong expectations of how the technology is going to change the world without understanding what it's going to take to make it better. So like data, it's so, so critical to have the right data. And I used to say this to customers is that AI without data or data without AI, it's like worthless or pointless. Like, why would you do this without good data? And so in the iterative of experimentation in one of these use cases to get really deep, it sort of unlocked this point where the customer had to make a decision and they started discussing it in front of us. Are they going to rethink their data strategy? And are they actually going to unlock some of the different ways in which they thought they had to manage their data so that they could make it more useful for their end users? And simplistic thinking, of course, do it. Like, you know, but they have to, you know, regulated industries, you got to be very, very mindful that if by mistake you make a decision today that, you know, you could regret tomorrow. But it opened up a discussion. It was great because it's funny. One of the customers actually offered to buy me an edible fruit basket because I said alignment outcome and then the strategy with data. And he was like, thank you so much. I was literally arguing this just an hour ago with my team that we cannot start with data. We need to know what you want. We need to know everyone's behind it and what you want. Then we can get you the data. And so like setting up that communication between the people was critical. So Vivek, as you are talking about this iterative experimentation to come up with a pivot, persevere, or park recommendation, are there any examples that you can share anonymously, of course, about times when the iterative experimentation led to a park decision? And if so, what were the ramifications of that? I'll get a little specific and, and honestly, and, and I'll, I'll use the financial services and a retail example. Essentially, we were looking at a bank and we were looking at, okay, here's what we think from our research that the bank's customers and customers would, you know, wealth advisors, wealth managers, et cetera, the actual customers would like 
for you as a bank to have access to or tools, et cetera. And so there, I want to say there are three or four use cases there. And as we hash them out, the bank did not feel like that the ROI for some of those use cases with the right ROI. They're like, you know, this is cool, but it's just not as compelling as we thought for the amount of effort it's going to take for us to change the way we work. And so we went a slightly different direction with the bank. And so we're, we're evaluating a different use case. It's actually even simpler use case, to be honest. But they just like, I'm not sure. And from the retailer one, oddly enough, a lot of retailers, as you know, like they acquire a whole bunch of different companies, right? So we had some, we had several use cases, really cool use cases, but some of them resulted in exposing some of their own data dependencies between the different acquired entities. And they're like, this is not something we can solve for in this timeline. And so then we pivoted to something from a timeline perspective that would work more for them. And, and I think part of the pivot for Severe and Park is uh, who are you presenting to or by when do you need this to happen? And so that also informed the second one. The retailer one was like, they had to present to a C-suite person and they said, you know what, we're going to go with the use cases that we know we can solve for and make sense. And we're going to park the other ones. And in the banking one, it was just a, the, the ROI just wasn't there. So we went a different route. So one of the things that we've seen when it comes to demonstrating value, whether it's any new technology or a new product, or in this case, an AI powered product or, or workflow is establishing some quick wins from just a change management perspective to show people what's possible. Can you talk a little bit about the approach you take in terms of generating or balancing quick wins with maybe kind of swinging for the fences, longer time horizon wins? So I think what we try to do is we try to balance a customer's long-term vision. So digital transformation is something that takes a long time. And we work with customers on digital transformation all the time. And so many times we're in the middle of a journey. One of the customers we're working with is a large insurance company. They're doing a massive transformation of their call center. And so um, actually a few of them are, to be honest. And so in that journey, that's a massive amount of work that's going to take. We're looking at some quick wins in that journey versus like the whole journey is going to be about AI transformation. And so in the journey, it's a three to six year journey total, like all of the stuff that they have planned. Ultimately, they want to be like the contact center for the future, you know, completely AI powered, et cetera, et cetera, data's, data's connected, et cetera. But they want to have milestones every year that showcase, hey, by doing this, this is how we've improved. And that ROI will keep feeding into like the longer term journey, which is like at the end of it, we will be at AI powered contact center. So I would say it's both always like we, we try to have a long term relationship with the customer. And as we're going that long term relationship, which will take a lot more change management, a lot more upskilling. This is why it's like the three steps of the maturity model. It's like turn the autobots, autobots features on is a really easy, quick win. And then having time to talk about the configuration, the blue sky thinking. So unfortunately, we're almost out of time. And so we're going to have to go to the lightning round. Let's do it. What are the top insights that you could share with other corporate AI executives that could really help them to save time and money in the space of AI development? I guess I'll go back to the thing that I see is most common. It's like, are you sure that you're aligned internally? Are you sure that you're getting the support that you need for the outcomes that you're trying to drive? And do you have the people that are going to actually help get your strategy there? I do find many times, by the way, that you don't realize you're being blocked internally because some people may not agree with the efforts that, uh, that you want to undertake. That's great. Anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered yet? I think it's really important to be grounded as we think about everything we're going through in the technology and the change in the industry. I think a lot of people, like I said earlier, are very anxious. And I think I'm an eternal optimist. Everything to me is optimism. Like, yeah, let's see the bright side of this. But I think it's important to stay grounded, whether it's optimism or pessimism. And it's really important. The reason I say that is it's good to build a really strong team. Um, I lean a lot on my team internally and like huge cross-functional team of people that give us all good advice and perspectives. And they're not all the same. There are different conflicting points of view. There's different ways to look at things. And I think having that perspective that will bring you grounding is super critical because you could wake up one day and, you know, somebody, the C-suite in your organization could believe that like, you know, this is, this is the future and you have to do it this way or certain, you know, whatever that is. But there could be somebody else in the organization that thinks completely differently. And because the power is in one place, the dynamics in one place, you sort of follow along. I think it's just important to have perspective, to be grounded, to constantly ask yourself like, is what we're doing make sense? Is it good for the business, et cetera, et cetera. So just grounding and perspective and sort of building a diverse team helps. And that reinforces alignment and strategy and focus on business outcomes as well.
Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure and hope to have you back on the show one day. Thank you, Ben. No, I appreciate it. And thank you very much for having me on the show. Thanks so much. The Lean AI podcast is brought to you by Lean Startup Co. To find out more about our Lean AI approach to generating more AI wins with far less wasted time and investment, including our training workshops, pilot programs, and full implementation offerings, visit us at www.leanstartup.co. Search the Lean AI podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, and make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Lean Startup Co., thanks for listening and sharing with your colleagues and friends if you found this episode insightful.